Welcome to the Lessons of Vietnam from the uh, international studios of Nissan Communications. I'm your host, Bill Dixon. Uh, tonight's show is going to be about a true hero, uh, Nick Rowe. He was one of the 34 uh, people who ever escaped from a POW camp in Vietnam. Uh, he was not in the Hanoi Hilton, not taking anything away from the men who served their time in Hanoi Hilton, but he was in the tiger cages in southern Vietnam, down in the swamps with the bugs and the snakes and the rats and just about everything else. Uh, but our next show, which will be, uh, let's see, December 14th, our guest that t night will be John Cope. He's with the North Carolina Museum of History, and his, uh, his job is curator of, of Militaria. I guess I said that right, Militaria. But he's going to be coming in talking about the North Carolina History Museum and their collection of military items. And they're uh, basically trying to get uh, anything they can get also uh, concerning the Vietnam War. Uh, if you'd like to uh, be part of the show, if you see on the screen there, uh, be sure to log in uh, to uh, give us a call on the phone or go to Skype and log in on that and ask questions, be part of the show and so forth. Uh, I believe you're going to find out that uh, Nick Rowe was uh, almost bigger, almost uh, a superhero uh, at the end were the things he went through. Uh, my next slide. Go. Next slide. Go. Uh, this is a picture, a pen and ink drawing by Ron Harris. Uh, Ron Harris is a member of North Carolina Vietnam Veterans. He's also the author of uh, uh, Etchings in Stone. Uh, this is a picture he did of, uh, of Nick, along with some other pictures that he did. Uh, some of his pictures of Nick are hanging in the Pentagon and uh, the Special Warfare and so forth. But uh, this is the cover of the uh, thing. Uh, this is a poem that was on the, um, uh, also with this picture. Uh, it's called A Fallen so Soldier. And I'm going to read it to you real quick. A soldier has fallen. He will not be forgotten. His spirit dwells in those whose lives he touched. He has led us. He has taught us. He has shown us the way. He gave us all of himself because he was made that way. He gave birth to an idea that will never go away. He did this all. And that was by Chief Warrant Officer Roe Gonzalez, who uh, was at the Sears School, uh, when uh, uh, Nick and Dan Pitzer were, were there. So, um, uh, Nicky, uh, his name was Nicholas, but down in Texas, they call him Nicky. Uh, first time we went to Texas to the school there, it's named after Nick, Nicky Rowe. Uh, they were calling him Nicky, and it took us for a moment to realize that they were talking about, uh, about Nick. He was born in McAllen, Texas. McAllen, Texas is about as far in Texas as you can be and still be in Texas. Uh, it's right on the Rio Grande River. On the other side, of course, is Mexico. He grew up in uh, McAllen. Uh, is well remembered there now and, and by a lot of people. Uh, he was uh, while he was in high school there. He joined a Demolo chapter, uh, who did and did quite well with them. He graduated from McAllen in 1956 and went directly to the United States Military Academy there at West Point. Um, We've been back to uh, his school uh, several times. This is a picture of Nick when he made Lieutenant, uh, Lieutenant Colonel, which was um, after he escaped from being uh, a POW, he was a major, and then shortly after that, he was made a Lieutenant Colonel. But um, uh, Colonel Nick Rowe, or Nicholas, he was one of 34. American prisoners who were to escape. He uh, escaped. He was in uh, POW camps down in the uh, Delta of, of South Vietnam, uh, where the Hanoi Hilton was in North Vietnam, uh, but the camps that he was kept in were down in the southern section of South Vietnam, down in the Delta, was nothing but swamps and canals and so forth. Uh, when he went to Vietnam, he was um, assigned a unit there. But as you see here, he started the Army's uh, uh, SEER school, Resistance, uh, uh, Survival, Resistance, and Escape SEER uh, training. Uh, for some reason, some of that got disappeared there. Uh, that, and that's basically how to teach people that are being POW to survive. So that's, uh, he went into that after he came back. 
Now, this is a picture of Nick uh, right after he was uh, going to Vietnam. He graduated from uh, uh, West Point in 1960. In about 1963, uh, during that time from getting out of West Point, he was going through special training with the uh, Special Forces, all the training and jumps schools and everything, and he was uh, assigned as the information uh, officer for a, a detachment, A-23, 5th Special Forces Group, which was a 12-man A-team, and they were located in a uh, base camp called Tanfu in Anwan Province, and uh, the A-23 were organized and advised a civilian irregular defense group, or as uh, we call it, SIDG, down in the uh, Delta. Uh, it was a uh, uh, pretty primitive place in itself when you call it a base camp. It's not what you would think. It was, uh, uh, they had very little facilities there. Uh, they had dirt floors and tents and, and so forth. So uh, when the um, Rocky Versace was a captain, and he flew in to uh, Tanfu to the camp there, uh, to uh, meet with Nick and the uh, Vietnamese lieutenant who had just taken over the group uh, about the uh, communists uh, taking over uh, a couple of villages in that area. Now, where they were, that camp basically was surrounded in, uh, it was in bad guy country, uh, Indian territories, we can say. Uh, uh, they were pretty much surrounded as it was, but uh, the, where the camp was, they were interested in um, La Cour, was uh, being taken over by the communists. Uh, they decided to go in and find out what was going on. Uh, Rocky precisely said that uh, he was going along, and they were really surprised because Rocky, uh, being what his position, wasn't supposed to go out on patrols like that. Uh, give me an idea. Rocky was uh, an absolute super soldier himself. He made a choice. He was either going into the ministry or he was going into the military, and he chose the military. But uh, they all uh, banded up and got their civilian uh, SID group and uh, led it out to La Cour. Uh, it's in, located in a communist VC uh, right next to the Yuman Forest. If you look on a map, you'll see Yuman Forest is down in South Vietnam. Um, when they got to the village there, they discovered almost everybody was gone. I mean, there was nobody around. The VC were gone. So... An earlier group of the Americans had left earlier, and they were going to be a blocking force. The blocking force idea is you go into an area that you know the enemy is located, you fight them, and when the enemy starts retreating, the blocking force gets them. Well, in this particular case, uh, the, 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 the communists had already left, and the problem was they had already left, and they were going the opposite direction of where the blocking force was. So there was no blocking uh, force at all. Well, uh, Nick and Rocky and Dan's group decided to go back a different way. And on their way back, they got ambushed. There was, uh, it's like any time else when the first bullet fires, there's always confusion uh, and so forth. Uh, some of the SIDGs who were not that well trained, uh, bullets coming from everywhere, some of them tried to run. And when they tried to run, they basically got mowed down. And uh, after about eight hours of, of fighting and so forth, uh, from the ambush, uh, they were starting to uh, run out of ammunition. Uh, there was a lot of uh, uh, the people wounded and so forth. So they decided to put, withdraw and pull out. Uh, all three of them had, had suffered some wounds. Uh, and then they, they kind of got the idea that they were not fighting a normal VC unit. They were fighting a main force, which was a uh, well-trained military. It wasn't the guerrillas they had normally been fighting. This was a well-trained North Vietnamese uh, military unit, a very large unit they'd been fighting with their just uh, uh, a few men that they had. Well, to make a long story short, uh, the three of them were captured. Uh, Nick spent 62 months as a POW in numerous camps throughout uh, South Vietnam. Uh, during those times, he suffered, uh, <coughs> suffered torture, disease, isolation, psychological torture, lack of food, and about anything else you could figure out a man, you could do to, one man could do it to another. Uh, Captain Rocky Versace was moved from the camp early. Uh, Rocky spoke uh, Vietnamese very well. Uh, he would not do anything the Vietnamese told him to do. He argued with them constantly. So they took him away and took him to a special camps. Uh, Nick and Dan saw him from time to time 
Uh, he was still having problems from his wounds he had received. He was uh, really poor physical health. His hair had turned white, and uh, but they were using him for propaganda purposes and so forth. Uh, after four years, uh, as I mentioned in the last show, uh, Dan Pitzer uh, was released with two other soldiers uh, to come to come home, and Nick was left there all by himself. Uh, he uh, was pretty despondent when he found out he was going to be by himself totally. On Sunday, September 26, 1965, Liberation Radio announced the execution of Rocky Versace and Kenneth Rohrbach. Um, in retaliation for some deaths of uh, three terrorists at Da Nang. Now, that report was later, later recanted, but now all that information has been classified, so there's no information available to find out exactly what happened. Uh, Dan Pitzer knew uh, Rohrbach uh, from being, uh, actually he flew in the plane over to Vietnam with him. Uh, there was some question about whether Nick was, uh, excuse me, uh, Rocky Versace was killed then because, uh, if I remember correctly, Nick and Dan from time to time saw him. Uh, but like I said, it's all classified now, so... Um, we don't know the true story of that. The next picture, this is after uh, Nick came back from Vietnam uh, as, as a POW. This is actually a replica. This picture was actually taken in McCain, uh, McLean, Texas, McAllen, Texas, excuse me, of Nick standing in front of the um, uh, replica of the tiger cage he spent five years in, uh, different size cages, and, and, and some of them on the ground, in the air a little bit. But this is a replica of the cage he spent his five years in uh, while he was there. During that 62 months as a, uh, of the prison of Congress held in a tiger cage, he, he made several escape attempts. Uh, and each time he was punished. But in one attempt, he was going out with another soldier who had been very ill. They soon discovered that the other soldier oh, could not keep up. Uh, even though Nick was uh, willing to uh, help carry him, uh, they realized with the comments coming at them and looking at him, they could hear him from the distance. Uh, the other prisoner decided that he should stay behind and let Nick go on. Uh, reluctantly, Nick decided, okay, I'll, I'll do that. But they captured the other uh, uh, injured or sick soldier before Nick got very far, and they called out and told Nick that if he didn't turn himself in, they're going to kill the other guy. So to prevent that from happening, Nick surrendered and uh, was taken back to the camps where he was again undergone uh, torture and uh, re-education and so forth. Now, as an intelligence officer uh, with the Special Forces, Nick had special information, special uh, about defense around uh, the base camp there and other things and so forth. But what he did was, uh, once he was captured... He convinced the um, communists that he was a drafted, he didn't join the military, but he was drafted and he was an engineer and he worked a lot with different universities and he didn't know much about Vietnam. He was just forced to be there. Uh, he worked on, didn't, when he was there, he was worked on schools and uh, hospitals and stuff before in Vietnam. He was not, uh, never once did he mention that uh, anything about him being a special forces officer, uh, information officer, anything. So they, um, they interrogated him over and over again, uh, but then they gave him some engineering problems, and so he had engineering at um, West Point, so he was able to uh, give them enough information that they thought, they, well, he is really, truly, truly an engineer. However, as you'll see later, Nick's deception was, was blown. When the Viet Cong managed to obtain a list of, high, of, uh, high, of prisoners from an American uh, high-value prisoner of war from a peace-seeking group of American war protesters, uh, they got the information uh, about the uh, prisoners uh, that were prisoners of war and information about them, their families, and everything else. So uh, his cover was blown there, uh, and there's more about, about that a little bit as we go along. Uh, but I can tell you the VC were, were furious, uh, carried on over to well after he left Vietnam. Uh, he found out they deceived him. Uh, they knew that the strate strategic information he had was almost five years old. It was no more good. 
But they kept interrogating him. Uh, they beat him. Uh, they tortured him. And one of the worst things they did, as far as I'm concerned, uh, he had, um, as, you, as I'll talk to you a little bit about later, he had, uh, he'd had uh, dysentery since about the second day he'd been captured. He had a rash all over his body from some kind of uh, a blight. He ended up getting very, very at one time. Uh, so he was in physically in pretty bad shape as it was. And if you've ever been to Vietnam, down in the jungles, the mosquitoes there are like hummingbirds. I mean, big suckers. What they did was they took him out and staked him out for two days along beside the canal with no clothes on, and the mosquito just ate him up to the point that he couldn't speak, he couldn't see out of his eyes and so forth uh, for uh, lying to uh, the benevolent people of uh, North Vietnam. And even after this torture, uh, Nick still refused to disclose any information whatsoever. So he knew that... Uh, his time was up that they were going to kill him. At the same time, a lot of uh, activity had been going on around the camp. Some of the uh, bird dog airplanes, those are the guys who fly low so somebody shoots at them, they know where the enemies are. But they've been flying around close by looking for the camps and so forth. Uh, there have been a lot of B-52 bombing coming in. Uh, the fast movers coming in and strafing the area. So they moved them around quite a bit uh, during this period of time. But he knew that... Uh, it was just a matter of time that they were going to do away with him. Um, on one of these particular times, they had been out for a couple of days. The helicopters and, and, and gunships were flying all over the place, and he overcame his guard and escaped, which created a real situation there because uh, if you saw from the picture, Nick wasn't a big guy, uh, but he, and he's also dressed in black pajamas just like the other guys. Uh, how do you know from a helicopter who's who? This is a picture of Nick in the hospital uh, after, he, after he escaped and was, was brought back home um, with all his uh, diseases and so forth. He uh, was in the hospital for a while, then they uh, basically debriefed him and, uh, and then let him go home. Now, the story of Nick Rowe in his five years as a POW is in a book he wrote called Five Years of Freedom. Now, I'm going to highly recommend... You get this book. It is very uplifting, but at the same time, you see what man can do to man. Uh, it's, it's terrible in what they do to him, but once you realize that this man went through all this and still came out and still was very successful in his life afterwards, it's, it's phenomenal into itself just what the human experience and what you can do uh, uh, if you put your mind to it. Uh, you can understand, uh, but you can't really comprehend uh, what he went through and so forth. But uh, you can go on to, you can go, this is the cover of the book. Uh, one of the covers, uh, I've got two or three copies of the book, and none of my covers look like this one, but this is the original book. That's a picture of Nick and I believe his parents um, as he came back. Uh, but like I said, there's several different color uh, covers. I've had several issues with his books, and they've been each cover has been different. Uh, you can go online to Amazon and pick it up for just pennies, or just about, or a couple dollars. Uh, get you a couple of books, one to read for yourself and keep, and one to give away. Uh, it's riveting, shocking, inspiring. Uh, I think it should be mandatory to anybody going into service, uh, high school students, college students. Uh, you just being totally in awe of what this man went through and uh, Rocky Versace and Dan Pitzer and what they did for, for our country. Now, I'm going to read verbatim some of the, uh, some excerpts out of, the, out of his book so you kind of understand just his story. Uh, it's not the whole book. I uh, just took some excerpts out of it. Uh, this is uh, going into the talking about his talking about uh, the, the base camp they started out as, as, as Tan Fu. Uh, at Tan Fu, there was one, only one way in or out, and that was by chopper, and it wasn't safe that way either because you had to fly in low and they're always getting shot at. The terrain of one kilometer away from camp for 306 degrees belonged to Charlie. That's the VC. It was isolated forces manned by American Special Forces A Detachment. Their Vietnamese Special Forces counterpart team and four companies, about 380 men on an average day of civilian irregular fence, the CIGs, as I mentioned. Uh, these were the young Vietnamese and Cambodians from the area who had been recruited, equipped, and resisted Viet Cong in their home villages. It was a lonely place for Americans. 
And this was right out of his book. A uh, problem that you realize right off the start with in the book, uh, when they're going out, uh, the Vietnamese had radios, the Americans had radios, the helicopters and the airplanes had radios, but they were all on different frequencies. Now, once they get to the point they're uh, being ambushed, uh, the Lieutenant 10, who was head of the, who's actually officially head of the whole, uh, whole uh, uh, process there, uh, they were there as advisors. Uh, he tried to call in on a radio for uh, artillery and support. He couldn't get through because the VC were jamming the signal. He gave uh, the um, radio to Nick. He tried to get through again. Uh, the radio was signal. He thinks he might have gotten through a little bit, uh, but the Viet Cong were jamming the uh, signals quite a bit. And now, as they, uh, as they were running out of ammunition and no uh, reinforcements were coming in, uh, no supporting mortars at the time, uh, things were getting kind of tight. They decided to uh, infiltrate and get away. Now, this is what, uh, what happens uh, then uh, from Nick's story. Uh, Rocky stepped ahead of me, taking the lead for our tiny group of Americans. He hadn't gone more than five or 10 meters when an automatic weapon fire from the right and Rocky sagged then dropped with a low moan. Oh shit, no, not now. I started towards Rocky's crumpled shape and started to kneel. A muffled a whomp to my front, a spay of stinging hot water and a huge fist slamming me backwards. I sat there up to my waist in water, the smell of burned black powder in my nostrils. My eyes were refusing to focus. Everything was multicolored haze. Sounds were coming from the end of a long, long tunnel. Everything was so far away. In other words, there was a mortar round or artillery round came in and hit right in front of him and, and knocked him down. The thought stood out in the gray fog that was my mind. I'm dead. He just kind of sit there dazed. But then as he came to a little bit, he cleared his head and started taking care of uh, Rocky's three wounds. Rocky was wounded three times in the leg. One of them uh, went through his kneecap. Um, I was making the final turn with the bandages. The reeds rustled behind me. Dong Te, Dong Te Lin came to sharp demand, which would probably be uh, surrender or what I don't know what it is in Vietnam right now, but came to sharp demand. I tied the bandage and slowly turned my head. There was a muzzle of an American carbine and, and a Viet Cong behind it. The two VC pulled my equipment harness from my shoulders, grabbed my arms, and quickly tied them behind me, once at the elbows and once at the wrist. God bless you, Nick. God bless you too, Rocky. D. That's what the Vietnamese said, which was hurry, uh, and they threw me down the path. Because along about that time, they had actually started getting artillery rounds hitting all around them. Uh, so they were trying to get out of the way so that the, the prisoners wouldn't get killed as well as the, as the Viet Cong wouldn't get, couldn't get killed. So they were pushing them down the um, uh, trails and so forth. I stumbled, almost fell. My arms were tied at the wrist and elbows, and this prevented me from balancing as I slipped and struggled in the muddy water. Another of the VC prodded me along with his spike of his carbine. Mao Di, he com uh, commented, go fast. They were anxious to get me to the rear as soon as possible. I stumbled into one of the deep irrigation trenches that bordered the rice paddy and found myself underwater with no means of pulling myself out. Both arms were tied behind his back. The VC uh, grabbed him and pulled him out of the water, uh, kind of, I guess, because uh, they were uh, wanted to make sure that they got him back to the back. Through the whirling, now this is how they got him out. He's going through the village they had just left. Through the whirling haze in front of my eyes, I saw crumpled, sprawl bodies strewn across the packed mud from front yards of the huts we had so recently left. Many of the bodies were stripped. A few still wore the black and green slash camouflage uniforms of the strike force. They call them tiger strikes. Uh, I found myself stepping over and around some of the dead strikers. Each had a gaping hole in front of his head his face unrecognizable after the explosive exit of the bullet. In other words, the Viet Cong went up and anybody was alive or dead, they went ahead and shot to make sure they were dead. The thought of dying was suddenly terrific and death was very real. 
Uh, this is when he was first captured. Uh, it was taking him back. Then they get him to a uh, somewhat of a uh, POW camp. And his second day there, I was spending more time running between the cage and the latrine than anything else. That's when he started having dysentery problems. We had been in, during that time, he was issued a pair of gray pajamas and aluminum cup, a plate, and a spoon apiece. Now, that's what he carried all the way through Vietnam, all the way during the Peninsula of War, was that cup, the plate, and a spoon to eat from. On the morning of 21 November, Dan and I were given a small can of sweetened condensed milk, which made the day seem like Christmas. We opened it at the urging of Mr. Moy. Now, they, went, they, chained, they uh, made special names for all their uh, guards and so forth. Uh, there were, they had some uh, uh, yes, yes. I mean, they had uh, nicknames for them so they could keep up with who they were. But Mr. Moy and, and Major Ha, uh, who appeared anxious for us to, uh, to drink and eat, um, as soon as the cannon was open, a photographer appeared. He was standing there in front of us. He took several shots of us with the milk. One was me scooping the delicious liquid out of my cup while Dan scowled. It was a long time before we saw another can of milk. Now, as the story goes along with that, they offered it to Dan and Nick. Nick said, uh, I'm hungry. I'll eat whatever I have to eat. Uh, Dan Pitzer said, that was Nick. And Dan said, I ain't going to let him take a picture of me. That photographer was later killed in a battle. Somehow or another, that picture was recovered. This is Ron Harris's, a uh, copy of Ron Harris's picture, it didn't come out too well, of, uh, that he did uh, a pen and ink drawing from that picture. Uh, Dan Pitzer asked uh, Ron to do this drawing uh, of him and Nick from the picture. But that picture, for some reason or another, was put in Dan Pitzer's 201 file for years. And it was well uh, sometime later uh, when that picture was discovered and Nick got it out and gave it to Ron. And that, this picture is also in the Pentagon uh, with uh, of them sitting on the tiger cage eating that condensed milk. My dysentery, which had gone progressively worse, was now accompanied by fever and nausea. There was a continuing inability to eat rice. Now, all of them, when they first got there, uh, had trouble eating the rice. Uh, you're told not to drink the water, but they didn't have much choice uh, when you go back. The rice was not uh, kind of cooked like you would normally think it would be, but uh, they, were having, he was having, they were all having problems getting it down and so forth. They were always getting propaganda officers come in and talk to them, uh, re-education, trying to re-educate them to uh, talk, uh, talk and tell them what was going on as far as Americans, uh, the re-education to make them to believe uh, as the communists did. Uh, didn't work most of the time. In January 1964, after two months, the guards from our first camp disappeared along with Major Ha and Mr. Ba and Moy. They were in and out, but even though they were in and out uh, periodically, one of those visits, Miri was squatting on, in the guard hut next to our cage as Dan and I sat on the uh, front porch. Do you know that Kennedy was killed? He asked slowly, carefully in Vietnamese to uh, get a response from them. Uh, you got to remember, the only news they got was going on then was either from Hanoi, Hannah, or what the guards told them. Uh, Sometime before this, we had been told earlier that uh, uh, South Vietnamese President uh, Dinh was, uh, had been overthrown and killed. The government of Saigon was toppling. The possibility that these reports might contain some truths made me wonder what was happening on the outside. I finally dismissed these reports uh, as false. I mean, they were going in and told how the American government was uh, crumbling, uh, the Vietnamese government was crumbling, and, and so forth. Now, the last week in January, Dan and Rocky were removed from the camp, leaving me by myself. Now, that was one of the things he was most worried about. I was again tormented by the thoughts of being in the camp alone. The fear of immediate death stilled, but the fear of unknown was a greater burden. I was given a pair of pajamas made from old rice sacks dyed with black dye that ran the first three or four times I washed them. In other words, they weren't as black after he washed them a few times. On February 15th, the concern about my, his continued loss of weight 
and problem with diarrhea was an all-time high. He was eating the same rice as, uh, as, as Dan and, and them had been uh, eating, but he was still, uh, where Dan was losing weight and so forth, uh, he was getting worse and worse. Year one passed on 29 October 1964, and as he was, I was eva evaluated, our situation with Rocky separated from us. John and UPOW added to the camp. Dan had been brought back. Dan in still dangerous condition himself, and myself weakling daily from the constant diarrhea. The only bright spot was that we're still alive. That was their first first anniversary. The year year began with a frightening explanation for my relative lack of weight loss while eating the same food as Dan. The healthy weight became an obvious abnormal swelling in my legs and abdomen. I had practically ceased to urinate. They pronounced the swelling a result of thung. I had very berry and was bloated with stored food fluid. Now, if you ever read any pirate stories, uh, always on the sea, they, uh, the sailors always had problems with berry berry because they didn't get fresh vegetables and so forth in their, in their diets. That's where uh, basically the berry berry came from. Now, at the end of April 1965, I was having severe problems with the LAC, LAC, fungus infection. I found myself perspiring heavily during the morning hours, which aided in lowering the salt level in my body, but irritated the splotch raised areas of fungus terrifically. The itching sensation was deep and continuous over the broad covered by the abnormal, abdominal disease. Bathing was difficult because the canal was practically dry and I had to dig a hole in the middle of it in order to get enough murky water to rinse off. Even if I had soap, it would have done any good, since the water did nothing more than replace the dried perspiration with a light coating of silt. The diarrhea had slacked off a bit, but maintained two or three times uh, regularity. Uh, the uh, fungus and so forth, it covers his, almost his entire body, uh, especially down in his gen genitalia area. Um, after his, uh, another escape attempt, he was inside his cage. My legs were thrust into the regular irons. That's the, every night when they put him in the cage, they put him in leg irons and, and, and tighten them up. Um, in regular iron that he'd been using. Then Slim, that was one of his guards, uh, grabbed my arms and fitting the U-shaped pieces over my biceps, ran the long bar under my back, threw the loops in my ankles, fastening my arms to my sides. I watched with attached interest as we proceeded to pull a bar up and under my shoulder blades, canning the angle, anklets back at a 45 degree angle and fastening the two ends of the rod, making it impossible for me to do more than bend my arms at the elbow. The leg iron was pulled down until I winced with pain. Doc Hong? He asked without emotion. Is there pain? I nodded yes. He grunted and gave it a couple of extra tugs, sending spikes of pain into my already cramping muscles. So now he's in, the, in his cage with his arms pinned behind his back and to his legs and so forth. Um, as I mentioned before, his, most of his information came from... Uh, I read, you know, uh, Radio Hannah, uh, Hanoi Hannah, as we used to call her, was there, I was our source of uh, news and it added nothing to raise our spirits. There was increasing use of U.S. reports and editorial comments on them by the North Vietnamese to validate their stand on the war. Uh, Hanoi Hannah made sure that they guys knew about all the protests and all the things that were going on back in the United States. Uh, the dissent within the United States gave them a means to encourage their followers. Influenced the uncommitted and challenged their opponents. Just the fact that the reports were in good English and came from Americans whose protest to the war took the form of support for the enemy was enough to create a feeling of hopelessness. You're out there, you're going through all this sort of stuff, all the disease, uh, deprivation, and you hear, all you hear on the news is uh, how things are going back in the United States, how the uh, protests are going on. You start wondering, what the hell am I doing here? Especially, what am I doing here as a, uh, as a POW? I could just imagine how much uh, helpless he felt. I felt somewhat the same way uh, when I was watching the, uh, the riots and so forth uh, while I was over there. This was uh, a little later on, an older cadre. Uh, different, people, different people would come into the camps and um, interrogate him or try to teach him the communist way. Uh, he always argued with them. Uh, gave them uh, strange information, and so forth. Uh, the older cadre 
came in. His was uh, this guy traveled around from camp to camp interrogating prisoners, but he began to speak, and the mafia translated. You are a POW row, and you are here to learn the decision of the Central Committee of the National Liber Front for Liberation of South Vietnam. Your comrades are no longer prisoners. They are to be released under the lenient policy of the front and allowed to return to their homes and loved ones. I knew this was coming, but it was still a shock. They were actually going to release them, and I was going to stay. Jim was with Dan and John. Then it hit me. I was alone. This is when they took Dan and John and, and Jim. Uh, I believe Jim was the one that was uh, pretty sick, and they took them out and left Nick there by himself. I passed my fourth year of captivity on 29 October 1967, thanking God that I was still alive and that three of our group had been released in time, in time for their lives to be saved because he knew that Dan and them were in such bad shape, but he's all by himself. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with Vietnam, there's a big holiday every year. It's called Tet. It's the London year. It somewhat goes along with the uh, Chinese New Year. Tet in Vietnam is a big time of celebration, uh, families coming together. There's nothing bigger in Vietnam than Tet. It's like Christmas, Easter, Thanksgiving, all, all rolled into one. Uh, during that, and that period of time, in 67, 68, the communists decided to, uh, well, we need a ceasefire. That way that our troops can go home and see their families, and the South Vietnamese troops can go home and see their families. So that was, uh, they decided to, let's have a ceasefire, and we're just going to put our weapons down and, and have the Tet uh, uh, holiday, and then we'll go back to fighting. Uh, this is what uh, Nick has to say about it in his, in his book. Tet, the Lunar New Year celebration was approaching and provided a perfect diversion. I noted in my observation that the seven-day ceasefire proposed by the NFL, that was the Communist National Liberation Front, would be a time to, to be extremely cautious. On January, on 31 January, I heard that NFL had hit major cities over the length of Vietnam. Hanoi's broadcasts were filled with glowing report, reports of victory after smashing victory for the NFL. Khan Tum, Play Coup, Ban Me Thuet. Da Nang, all big cities in, in South Vietnam, uh, city after city was being overrun. The Arvins, that, which was the uh, Army of the Republic of Vietnam, was disintegrating. The American command was in turmoil. The people's forces, the communist forces, were in complete control of all the battlefields. Now, that's when the uh, news reporters uh, were saying that the Viet Cong had got into the American embassy, uh, which was uh, proven not to be true. Uh, a lot of people who had been going, um, supporting the war up until that time, turned against the war. Uh, the idea was a lot of the South Vietnamese troops had taken off for the uh, Tet uh, holidays and so forth. Uh, there was some um, information out that was possibility of attack. Uh, to give you a personal story, uh, I was going to meet my wife in R&R, &R, uh, uh, at the end of December, uh, just before the uh, Tet holiday. And I was going through town. I was running the back of a deuce and a half uh, truck uh, going through uh, Saigon to go to Thompson Air Base. And then we noticed the guy that was riding with me, we noticed and mentioned all the funeral carts that we saw. They were everywhere. Uh, the Buddhist funeral carts looked like circus wagons, very ornate and so forth. And we, we know, in fact, I took a picture of, uh, of some of them. And later when we came back and Tet started, uh, I discovered that what was the using the funeral carts were to bring in uh, ammunition, uh, weapons, and soldiers for the Tet, uh, a Tet attack in the Saigon with the funeral carts and so forth. So Then came the commentary from the United States. We had obviously lost. The government of Saigon cannot guarantee security. The question is no longer in doubt. We had lost. Pull American troops out immediately. Senators and congressmen again in all alleged statements calling on President Johnson to stop bombing the North, to get American troops out of Vietnam and let the VC take over. If they really knew who the VC were and what a victory for them would mean, they wouldn't bring them out. 
I totally refuse to accept the validity of the indictments of our policy and the elections. He was saying that he didn't think the people that we elected would turn against their troops in their war and leave those, uh, all the men who died in the prisons of war. My guards for these members of uh, government was too high to allow me to accept their uh, employment of propaganda tools. He wanted to believe that what he was being told wasn't a true, but the only time he was also seeing it coming in from um, American reporters as well as the Vietnam reporters. In reality, the 1968 Tet Offensive was a big loss for the communists uh, militarily. The BC were killed in such large quantities that they were not able to really continue fighting uh, as, a, as a unit. They had to be supplemented by uh, regular NVA troops to come back in uh, because they had lost so many men. Uh, almost all of the places that they had attacked and had control of for a day or two within a week were back into American and South Vietnamese hands with except for the city of Way. Now, the problem with the city of Way, it was the Imperial Castle, uh, uh, for the original uh, king of, of Vietnam, and they were told not to bomb it. They didn't want to destroy the city with bombs and so forth. So we lost a lot of Marines and a lot of South Vietnamese soldiers going in there trying to get the Viet Cong house to house, door to door, uh, 100 yards a day was, was, was a uh, real adventure getting, getting that much done. But um, with that, they were less than a month that they were there before they got them out. It may have been a political uh, win for the communists, but a costly one for their troops, because that's when the American public kind of turned against the war. Uh, Nick had al always, as I mentioned before, argued with his uh, propaganda and re-education re cadres, and this is an event here. Uh, on Jia on Fong wants your mosquito net and clothing, Porky said. That was the name he had for one of his guards. You want to wash the clothes I'm wearing? I repeated. Base, which was another of his guards, only nodded a strong affirmative. At this point, my suspicions were not aroused, but my thoughts of standing or squatting around that kitchen without the protection of long pajamas and a shirt were frightening. I stripped down to the ragged black shorts I was wearing as a stopgap at efforts against the penetration of mosquito stingers. Didn't think much about it. But later, as he was settled into his cage that night and getting ready to have his leg irons put in, purely in reflex uh, action, I started to reach for the leg iron, then realized how I was dressed. Wait a minute, On. Where's my mosquito net? Where are my clothes? Bay said, Your net and clothing are not dry yet. You can sleep like a soldier of the Liberation Army tonight without a net. In other words, he was saying they could, he could sleep uh, just like the, uh, the V.C. had to sleep. The torn and frankly mended shorts were no good at all, and my body was soon completely covered with swarming, probing insects. The first sensation of hundreds of simultaneous penetrations and injections of the insect's anticoagulant is almost an exquisite pain like the sharp bite of a lemon juice on a fresh tooth extraction. It rapidly began as intolerable annoyance. I could feel the pulpy mass in my hand each time I slapped at a concentration of stings and crushed another 50 or so of my tormentors. There was no spot on my body that wasn't covered now. They drove up my face, neck, arms with fanatic urgency. I don't even want to th think about that, just how bad that was. Once in contact or near the source of human warmth, they seemed to go berserk in their plunge to reach blood. I could sense the welts rising from the constant assault. I couldn't kill them fast enough. Blood and crushed mosquito bodies smeared my skin, and this drove the new arrivals into a wilder frenzy. The constant, unrelenting torments was indescribable. Numbness had given way to raw, open, sharp pain as the nerve endings writhed upon the onslaught. The body's defense were overwhelmed. The nervous system was flashing red lights across the board. Now, all this is coming from Nick. Uh, and why he was uh, thinking about it at the time. After, sometime after that, uh, Nick was taken to a hut where uh, another older man was there, and this is what the uh, uh, older man says. I am a representative of the Central Committee, having come to this camp to say a few words to you. 
His voice, his voice was easily identifiable as one accustomed to command. It is fortunate for us that the peace and justice loving friends of the South Vietnam Front for National Liberation in America, now it's important that you realize that it came from America, have provided us with information, which leads us to believe you have lied to us. According to what we know, you are not an engineer. You are not assigned to the military, to the many universities in which you have been uh, uh, listed for us. You have much military training, which you deny. The location of your family is known. You are an officer of the American Special Forces. Your father's name is Lee, and your mother's name is Florence. Next comments. I felt myself cringing inwardly as my carefully constructed cover story came crushing down around me. The words became a blur of sound. He was picking me to pieces. Oh, dear. God, I'm scared. God, I'm scared. I fought to control the trembling in my bent knees, fought to mask the effect that pieces of paper was having on me. He wasn't guessing. He knew. Now, one day when he was uh, cleaning up around the kitchen and so forth, uh, he looked and saw a set of orders that had his name on them. And he took time to read them. And this is what Nick says to say about it. The order I had seen in their ammo container filed for me to be transferred from regional level to zone level effectively marked me for extinction. They knew, he knew that he had been, they caught his lie. They knew they were mad. And they knew when they transferred him out that he didn't have very long. Now, along about that same time in the, in, in the uh, frame, there was been a lot of activity of uh, uh, planes coming out, helicopters coming to work in the area. So they were having to constantly move the camp around, uh, spending nights and so forth, uh, hiding out in the jungles and so forth. Uh, and, of course, Nick is dressed up as uh, looks like the V.C., but they had to keep moving around. And he decided this was a good opportunity for him to uh, possibly escape. But there was a problem. And he tells us the problem. It was obvious that I was wearing black pajamas and would look like any of the VC to a pilot. And my deep tan face, even with a beard, would be just another horror-stricken VC face in his, to his combat-conditioned eyes. The split-second hesitation required for him to identify my beard and relate to the Asian lack of facial hair would be time enough for me to shoot him out of the sky. That's how low the helicopters and stuff were flying, if he were wrong. It wasn't actually a beard he thought he had seen. No, the pilot would not hesitate to shoot him first in this situation, and I don't blame them one bit. That had to be uh, quite a uh, dilemma. You want to escape, and you know that if you jump up and holler, here I am, uh, they're going to come in, uh, guns blazing and so forth. I evaluated my chances and came up with a grim picture. The guards had standing orders to kill an American prisoner if they couldn't guarantee his security. It was a case of kill him rather than take the chance of having him get back to the Allies. In other words, kill the prisoner so he can't get back to the Allies. Um, signaling, signaling a helicopter would be damn risky at best, but he still had to make a decision. During the running around trying to hide from the uh, helicopters and the bombings coming in, uh, Nick was able to uh, tell his guard, don't follow the other guys. They don't know where they're going. I'm, I'm American. I know where they, I know how the Americans think coming in. So his guard started second guessing and followed Nick. And that's how Nick got his guard away from the rest of the Viet Cong or, or communists was by telling the guy that he would lead him from away from where they were going. So... Uh, he gets his guard uh, out there uh, kind of by himself. He sees the uh, helicopters coming in close. So this is what he says next. I selected a short limb, almost two inches in diameter, and stepped quickly behind Porky. That was his guard's name. The sharp blow caught him at the base of the skull, just below the back of his floppy bush hat. He sagged and dropped immediately without making a sound. I dropped the club and chopped him twice with the edge of my hand, delivering the blows to the side of his neck below the jawbone. I didn't intend to kill him, but I didn't want him to follow me when I moved out. Up in the cobras, 
This was the Cobra helicopters coming in, shooting up the area. I learned the, uh, from I learned later, the radio crackled into life. They saw him standing out there waving a, uh, a white rag. There's a VC, VC down there in the open. And then all of a sudden, on the other ship was, from the other ship came to reply, gun him. The covers were preparing to make a firing pass which would have reduced me to another, cr another crumpled heap of body, uh, bloody flesh and tattered rags. But he had to do what he had to do. From the command ship, which had been joined by the, uh, joined the Cobras, came the voice of Major Dave Thompson, flight commander of this group. Wait one. I want a prisoner. Cover me. I'm going down to get him. They saw, the, they saw a person standing out there in the middle of the field waving a rag. They didn't know who it was, but they figured even if it was a Viet Cong, uh, there was a chance they could get, catch him and uh, get him as a prisoner. Um, so... As the gunship is coming in, or the command ship is coming in, the door gunners strain to catch a glimpse of the black-clad figure standing in the clearing, waving that white cloth. Their fingers were tense upon the triggers of their M60 machine guns, and they waited to foil any trap that might have been set. Suddenly, one of them, looking down, spotted the beard. Wait one, sir. The shout went over the microphone with an urgency unique to one soldier who sees another in need. That's American. The response was immediate. What they had to worry about was uh, quite often the Viet Cong would throw a smoke grenade trying to uh, lure a helicopter to come in to pick up a non-existent wounded and so forth. So Nick was uh, brought back, uh, put in the hospital, you saw, uh, interrogated to a certain extent, uh, debriefed uh, about his episode there. Uh, in 1971, Nick was assigned to the Army Adjutant Generals to work on the Army's POW MIA program. He uh, did a lot with that. He was also uh, worked with the League of Families, which was the families of uh, the POW MIAs. Uh, during that period of time is when he wrote the book and published it, The Five Years of Freedom. He wrote several uh, magazine articles and, uh, and so forth. He also wrote the Southeast Asia Survival Journal for the United States Department of Air Force. This was a, uh, the first kind of seer school uh, training that he did for the Air Force, teaching their people how to become, uh, if they became uh, POWs and so forth. In 1974, Nick decided to leave active duty but continued to serve in the United States Reserve. In 1981, he came back into service with Special Forces at Fort Bragg, and one of his jobs when he came back was to start the, um, uh, by then he was a lieutenant colonel, he was uh, tasked to get with Dan Pitzer, and they started the SEER school uh, based on their experiences while they were POWs, the, the uh, Survival, Evasion, Resistance, and Escape uh, School. The course is considered the most important advanced training sp uh, special operations in the field. It's still being taught at the John F. Kennedy Warfare Center uh, here at Fort Bragg. In 1985, Nick left the SEER school uh, which Dan continued uh, teaching there, but Nick was assigned and became command of and took command of the uh, battalion with the Fifth Special Forces Group, and then 1987, uh, he was made a full colonel and was assigned uh, to become the chief of the Army Division of the Joint United States Military Advisor Group in the Philippines, which is a mouthful in itself. Uh, his job was to investigate the communist insurgency of the Philippines. The communists were starting to move in. Uh, some of the guerrilla groups there were trying to take over the president. So he came in and, and um, was to uh, help the government, and he worked with the CIA and, and other groups and so forth. But in February of 1989, Nick sent a communique to Washington, D.C., where his um, uh, information he'd got from his spies and, and his uh, contacts and so forth had said that the communists were uh, planning on something big, and they were going to uh, hit a high-profile target. Now, according to Nick, he was number two or three on that list. Uh, he didn't consider himself as number one. But during this period of time, also, when he, when he made this report, uh, he must have knew something was going on because he sent his uh, special forces ring, his beret, and his Bible back to his wife at Fort Bragg.
On April 21, 1989, Nick's riding in an armored limousine and it was returning from uh, some meeting he had to the United States Embassy. And at that time, hooded members of the communist uh, insurgency uh, attacked his vehicle with automatic weapons. Now, under any other time, uh, the, uh, the uh, automatic weapons, machine guns, and so forth would not have affected the car whatsoever or in the people inside. But for some strange reason, this particular day, the air conditioner was not working on the car. If you remember, if you're old enough to remember, some of the cars had these little side vent windows. Well, the driver, the chauffeur of the limousine, had the windows, those side vents open, get a little bit of air because of the hot Philippine and humidity and so forth. Well, in that attack, during that attack, some of the bullets got through that window, and it killed Nick almost instantly uh, when it hit him. Uh, how? Uh, well, that's another story. How that the bullets got through that little window. Now, in eight, 1989, the U.S. Veteran News Report. Uh, this is a, a magazine that was uh, done by Ted Sampley out of um, uh, Kinston, North Carolina. Ted knew more about the POW issue than anybody I had ever met in my life. Uh, Ted uh, died uh, somewhat questionably, but he, um, where he got all of his information is just unbelievable. Uh, Ted got the information uh, from uh, whatever contact he had that when they put the soldier for the, uh, the remains of the uh, unknown soldier from Vietnam uh, in the tomb in Washington, that they knew who his family was at the time. They just didn't want to tell anybody because they wanted a body, which um, Ted told the family, and later uh, Lieutenant Blasi was, uh, was uh, uh, removed and, and, and with his family. But this is what his magazine came out, reported that a source who had served under Nick had made the statement that the Vietnamese communists wanted him dead and most likely collaborated with the Philippine uh, communist insurgency. Sometime before, uh, Nick was, with the, uh, was on a Delta Force uh, mission, and they had to come in and get him and put him in witness protection because they knew that the uh, North Vietnamese communists were uh, uh, there at that place uh, trying to assassinate him. So uh, they had been looking for him for some time. Now, there are three questions uh, maybe you can give us an answer for. How did the communists know where Nick would be at that particular time? How did the communists know the route? He changed routes constantly. The only people who would know what the route was were people at the embassy and Nick and his driver. Why did the air conditioning break down on a perfectly maintained car? Why was Nick ordered to not to be armed on his uh, visit to whatever meeting he was? Those are some interesting questions to uh, answer as we uh, ponder the life story of Nick. Now, Nick uh, was uh, brought back and buried at Arlington Cemetery. Uh, Nick is buried at Arlington National Cemetery. His grave is on the hill next to the uh, Unknown Soldiers Monument. If you're facing the um, uh, amphitheater for the Unknown Soldier, to the left of that up on the hill is Nick's grave. Uh, chances are, if you're ever up there, you need to go by and, and see Nick's uh, a grave. Uh, whenever we go up there as a group, we always ask the old guard to furnish us a... Uh, bugler and a color guard and we always do a service of remembrance for Nick. Uh, a guy walked up to us a couple of years ago and said, oh, did y'all know Nick Rowe? We said, yes, he was one of our members. He says, well, I'm from McAllen, Texas and have a school named nothing. And next thing you know, we're, we're at McAllen, Texas visiting the school there, which we've been back twice. But you need to go and visit the site and, and see Nick. Now, on the, on the uh, Nick's uh, headstone on the back side. This is a poem he wrote in 1964 while he was a POW. So look up, up ahead at times to come. Despair is not for us. We have a world and more to see. Why this remains behind. Basically what he was saying there is don't give up. What we're going through today will be eventually be behind us as we go on with our life. And Nick Rowe illustrates everything there is 
to being a hero, American soldier, patriot, or whatever else you want to call him, uh, a special man. Uh, thank you for tuning in to the show. Uh, John Cope with the North Carolina History Museum will be our guest on our next show. Uh, today is uh, Thanksgiving Eve. I hope the great turkey is good to you all tomorrow. Be safe if you're traveling. And again, looking forward to seeing you next show. And thank you very much for tuning in. And get in contact with us and give us some ideas if you want some additional shows, what kind of subjects you'd like, uh, guest or uh, whatever. But let us know what's going on, what you'd like to see, and we'll try to have it for you. Good night. You're tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. And if you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it in the archives section on nissancommunications.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, and like us on Facebook. Sponsored by Atomos.com, makers of quality video recorders and converters, CarolinaApparel.com, and DeltaForce.net.